here are quite happy to hear that. Uh, this morning we have we have uh, oh I need to get part in arms at work there. So this morning uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, end our election season for our club anyway uh, with the PUD commissioner number one position. And we have Will Purser and we have Ken Hayes uh, here to, to, I'm sure they can, as we've heard so many times, they can each do each other's spiel uh, as, as good as the other one can. <laughs> so we, we flipped a coin and uh, Will will be going first, or no, Ken will be going first on the opening statement. And that will be a three minute opening statement. No, oh, was it the other way? Will was going to go first. Ken was going to go first at the uh, at the closing statement. I'm neutral. There we go. Okay, that's I can can hardly remember. That's why I retired. I have trouble remembering. So, so uh, anyway, we have three minute opening statement uh, of each party, followed by one minute rebuttal if they want. We'll get right into questions and take however long they need to to answer each of your questions. Please remember to ask questions uh, that both candidates can uh, answer equally. And then we'll have a, a closing, two minute closing statement and we'll be done. So without any further ado, please. Tim, you're ready to go. Okay, I'm Will Purser, incumbent PUD commissioner seeking re-election. My wife and I moved to the Olympic Peninsula about 25 years ago after I retired from Royal Dutch Shell where I was operations and engineering management. And no, I'm not solely responsible climate change. Uh, as an engineer, I uh, engineer by education with undergraduate and graduate degrees. I'm a licensed uh, uh, professional engineer in a number of states, California, Colorado, Texas, and a member of the Institute of Engineers in the UK. Operative word there is retired. I've represented PUD customers since 2001, many years as the commission chairman, Chairman of Energy Northwest, Executive Board, past member of the Public Power Council, Executive Committee, PUD Association, Energy Committee, and representative KnowingNet, which is the public power uh, broadband fiber system. My community services included a retired member of Rotary, Swim Museum and Arts Center Board, Volunteer Boys and Girls Club, and the Nutrition Center. I have two children, a daughter in Oregon, graduate of uh, UW and his son in California, who was UCLA. I'm a veteran, U.S. Army, discharged in uh, 1969. Proud to say I'm not a politician. I like to deal in facts and issues, so I hope your questions kind of prompt that. I'm a strong advocate for the PUD and public power in general. Uh, during my tenure on the commission, the PUD has continuously improved, and I share credit for that with past commissioners commissioners and with staff. Um, the story of public power is the PUDs were formed back in the 1930s. So your PUD is over 80 years old and it served you well during that period. The point of public power was to provide the low cost hydropower from the federal hydro system. And uh, that's what we've been doing. So anyway, thank you. And uh, if you want more information, go to my website, willpersonforfor.com. Hello, and uh, thank you for having us. Uh, we are, I think, both of us very glad this is our last event for the election season as well. We had a very long day yesterday, and I can say he's buying later. And I'm buying later. <laughs> we disagree on a lot, but we definitely agree on uh, the fact that we're both going to need a nice glass of scotch after this is all done. Um, anyway, my name is Ken Hayes. I'm a longtime resident of SWIM. I'm a Registered and licensed architect uh, with my practice based in Swim since 1988. During this campaign, my opponent and I expressed opposing viewpoints about what we believe is most important for our PUD ratepayers, what the future of energy looks like, how best to manage our water resources, what customer service and satisfaction looks like. Despite disagreeing on much, we do agree on one thing, the quality of the professional PUD organization. The PUD organization is dedicated and hardworking. There are areas needing improvement, customer service, how the budget is structured, and some employee dissatisfaction due to favoritism, but none of these issues require major changes to correct, but I believe it does require a different style of leadership. I believe management, supervisors, and staff want to deliver the best possible service, 
and to make a difference, the right resources and tools, the PUD can and will excel in every area of operation. Understanding this comes from experience and training in municipal government and civic leadership. I respect my opponent, do not judge his motives, but I do differ from him on how best to lead. Whereas I am eminently qualified and have all the technical prowess to understand the core business areas of the PUD, I'm also highly trained, tested and proven as an effective civic leader with an excellent track record of accomplishments. My opponent is clearly more comfortable spending his time at meetings in Olympia, Portland and the Tri-Cities rather than focusing on issues here at home and engaging the rate leaders. I am process oriented, project driven and with the ability to move diverse groups of people often with competing interests together towards common goals, safe, affordable, reliable and resilient energy and water resources. We must mitigate the extraordinary risks we face being a small market in a remote rural county at the end of a very long, exposed and vulnerable extension cord connected to BPA. My opponent believes we can rely on BPA hydropower alone forever, and it's best to do nothing but maintain status quo. This position, historically common among Washington PUDs, is obsolete. Today, PUDs all around us across the nation and around the world are racing to diversify and expand their energy portfolios to meet growing demand, the electrification of everything. By 2050, the demand for energy will reduce our share of hydro from 85 to 35 percent. Doing nothing to prepare for this transformation is unsustainable. Okay, thank you. Now we'll get into questions, and uh, I hear we have one online. Let's yeah, go right there. Right one that. Online. Uh, so Rebecca. Okay, she's not on, but I can. Oh, wait, there she is. Hi. No, I was going to ask the the guys to ask the question for me. Um, I was just wondering, kind of a two part. How important to you is transparency of PUD to the public, and what will you do to proactively seek out public input? Ken, you're first. Um, well, I think it's absolutely imperative. I think the key to success in any uh, public organization or municipal government is openness and transparency. And I think that it takes active and aggressive engagement to get public input and uh, to accomplish uh, major goals. Um, I would work hard at that. I mean, I think my track record on the Swim City Council and in other uh, elected positions and volunteer organizations uh, have been hallmarked by that very uh, aspect. Uh, active and aggressive engagement, uh, going wherever you have to and doing whatever it takes to, to engage people and collect their input. Um, you know, I, I know my opponent's best interest is the rate payers. I mean, I can't assume anything but that, but I think it takes more than just opening up public meetings and hoping people show up. Uh, my experience on the Swim City Council, uh, including passing two gas, two tax increases, sales tax increases during the worst recession in memory, um, was a result of that very type of active and aggressive engagement, reaching out, going to where the people are, and that's how I would approach it. I would take the meetings to the people, I would engage people at every available opportunity, whether it's a library or a, uh, a service club meeting such as this, or the uh, um, various stakeholders meetings like the councils and the county and commissions and uh, other organizations like that. Well, the cans are going to force me to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the PUD is subject to the Public Open Meeting Act, Public Records Act. We have an active communications uh, program where we pub publish and the radio spots and all that. As far as commissioners are concerned, I have spoken before various city clubs, the Grange, various uh, Rotary clubs, uh, Chamber of Commerce, and so on. You know, it's all done in public. Decisions cannot be made except in public. So decisions are made at the PUD meetings. And to be quite honest, I'm always a little disappointed in not enough uh, public uh, participation. We have taken uh, our meetings on, on the road, We've gone out to the West End, Squim, Port Angeles, Forks, and uh, especially during periods where we're approving budget and we're approving a rate, rates, and uh, when there's important announcements to be made. So 
we can up our game there. Because basically one of the things that I've learned from this campaign is um, people need more information about the benefits of public power, what the PUD does. We get accused of making a profit. We don't make a profit, do everything it costs. So uh, I think that uh, we're doing a lot already, but of course we can do more. Okay, anybody else got a question? Okay. Um, so my question <clears throat> is in with, with regard to Carlsberg. Um, there is a lot of uh, developable land uh, within the UGA, but outside the water service area. Um, with the PUD currently only utilizing about 30% of their existing water rights and the presence of the very deep well or, or the Van Land well, um, how important do you see the use and utilization of that well in the near future, specifically, I guess, when we can consider those developable areas and provide housing? Um, I understand there's an, well, I'll just leave it at that. Will, you're first. <clears throat> okay, this issue came up, uh, as it's been going on for years. We've been trying to secure additional water rights for the UGA and for the expanded Carlsberg area. The county brought a memo, a memorandum of un understanding to us a couple of weeks ago, asked us to sign that. And this was a first step, just out outlining the interest of the UUD our customer and the interest of the county. Non-binding, but it was important first step. So my question was, well, if we got public input on this, the county said, well, no. Our staff said no. So I said, well, we need to have a public meeting and let people know that this is going on because they actually have water rights in that local utility district. Those water rights are for full build out of that uh, LUD. So we had the public meeting. And, and after hearing the story or getting public input, we came back and approved that MOU. So that's the first step. And the issue there was that, yes, we're sitting on a lot of water rights for the LUD, but that's for full build out. We've only used something like 23% of it. So by opening up that water to be accessible to the, the uh, UGA and the expanded Carlsberg area, that will prompt the college to give us more water rights. It will also, uh, like the gentleman pointed out, it will open up development for housing and all those things. So we're we're on board with that, and we're we're doing that. So. Um, you know, it's absolutely imperative. I mean, water is a shared resource. Uh, it's not actually owned by individuals with private wells or water systems with community systems or the PUD. It's owned by the state and access to it is granted by the state. And I think the difficulty in acquiring additional water rights, which is absolutely critical to our growth and development and our economic prosperity, demands that we show great cooperation and uh, developing resources and ensuring that the demands of growth and development are met. Um, you know, I, I find it uh, kind of astounding that it took, you know, the MOU that my opponent refers to was the precedent um, based on hundreds, if not thousands of hours of, of county and PUD staff in order to establish, you know, uh, the, uh, the interest of both parties and the common parties together and was the precedent before you go out and gather additional information and engage it. Um, you know, I also find it interesting that my opponent keeps talking about wanting public input, but during this meeting he's referring to, I mean, he would interrupt speakers and contradict the things that they were sharing and his observations or opinions, right or wrong on the opinions. I mean, the job is to listen and take the input from the shown. I think the resources should be allocated where they belong in order to support uh, growth and development, which is actually the underpinnings of municipal development uh, as mandated by federal law. Stay up there, you, you be first. Uh, given that and um, the reported uh, scarcity currently in these orders, I would like both of you to give your um, vision as it were of how you see uh utilities and uh availability playing out in our county as more people move here because they're 
your house fell off the bluff and the state court closed. There are wildfires dispersed and what anyway, kind of refugees, they are moving here. And this is pretty good question on our infrastructure. And what kind of tax they included, and also they provided there's a lot of there's a lot of subjects to hear from the question. I'd like both of you to give your ideas about how to deal with that. Well, thank you for that easy question. <laughs> you know, it, it's a really good question, and it touches on so many things that are important to us here. Um, you know, we are often um, caught, you know, between a rock and a hard place here. We are a small uh, market in a remote rural county. Um, you know, we, uh, we struggle. We have one road in, one road out. Um, and much of that uh, is because we're just simply not big enough and important enough in the grand scheme of things to warrant enough attention to improve you know, transportation access and those things. So the key to that is to grow. And we will grow. We have grown slowly. In the 45 years I've been here, we've grown 40%. But we are still well below the threshold where we are no longer considered a small market. Now, to grow requires uh, new industry. You know, our important industries that we have here, like tourism and housing, are good, but they don't bring new dollars in in the way that you need to from exporting product out. So it's a really difficult challenge. And I happen to think that PUD is a key player in that uh, process of actual growth and development for the community. So to answer your question specifically, I think it's absolutely important that we continue to be vigilant and forward thinking on how to ensure that we have adequate energy and water resources to serve the growing population. Um, I think people will continue to come here. We live in a really great place. And the problem with living in a really great place is other people discover it and also want to come and live yeah. here as well. So I just think it takes a lot of effort on a lot of different fronts. And I think that's the most important part about that for me and the race we're in is the role, the ever expanding and important role that the PUD plays in our economic development and partnering with all the other organizations within the county. Okay, um, that was an easy question, thank you. <laughs> no, um, yes, there is some population growth. There is, uh, we only see, we see less than 1% of our meter town of power sales going on. And that's due to an active conservation program where people are using less energy. There are we have 450 rooftop solar installations <laughs> in the county, which we have provided technical assistance and interconnection and net metering assistance with that. So those are the things that we would take our resources, <laughs> spread that over. <laughs> Population the uh, under the uh, Bottleville contract that we're under now, and we don't know what the new one's going to look like, but it's looking like it's due to participation in going to all these uh, meetings. Uh, Ken uh, criticized me for uh, we've influenced that contract. It should allow us to buy full requirements for our customers, and Bottleville will provide that under what's called the uh, well, it is a full requirements, but it's also based on the uh, contract, high watermark, and hydrosis. Anyway, it's complex. But uh, anyway, I, I think, as far so as water is concerned, getting water rights is very difficult. It's not a slam dunk. You go to ecology, you ask water rights, five, ten years later, you might get those. But we're actively making a case for that. I think our move on the Cosmere water system open, open us up to more water. Yep, there was. Oh, okay. Good. I know I think it up and down. Oh, what has gotten? I was wondering if you had a backup question. <laughs> if I had one? Yeah, I just. I was actually going to ask about the Carlsberg water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be good. Nick's got enough. I think they have so cool. much time, but no one else is going to raise it. <laughs> so, with the, um, I guess, emergent popularity of, um, the public and legislature wanting to tear down hydroelectric dams, specifically along the Snake River. Um, you know, historically, Washington has been very reliant on that as what's no longer considered a renewable energy. Um, so, 
as far as the impact on the removal of dams on our community, and I, I really like the analogy of, you know, sitting at the end of an, an extension cord here, um, and the emergence of folks with solar panels and things like that. What do you see your role or, or as a leader in securing consistent power with the emergence and desire for new renewables, being solar, wind, and such, um, being pursued both privately and publicly in, in the power grid? Okay, thank you. Let's go back to the dams. You know, under present uh, legislation, there's two bills that we're having to operate under. One is the Energy Independence Act, which doesn't recognize hydro as renewable. Then more recently, there was the Clean Energy Transition Act, which does recognize hydro as renewable. Uh, as far as the dam was concerned, uh, given that we're going to electrify every transportation, building codes, on and on goes, the, you know, the amount of electricity required over the next few decades for the so here you've got our resource, talk about the Snake River Dam. It's zero carbon, it's, it's uh, hydro, so it, it is renewable, and uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to take those dams out at this point. Given, and I'm on a resource adequacy task force looking at, you know, the problem with all of this is it's not within Fallon County, it's beyond for transmission and the hydro system and, and so on. We're looking at all kinds of options, uh, all the way up to small modular nuclear reactors. Just had a meeting here last week with uh, talking about micro reactors, 10 megawatts. They have to be refueled every eight years, and very low surveillance, walk away safety systems, and all that. I'm not advocating for that, but there are options out there. At some point, as we approach this uh, 2045 uh, zero carbon thing, we may have to take a position in something like that. And so all options on the table. We're working with Energy Northwest, with ENNL, all those. You know, one of the challenges of uh, running for this office, uh, and I'm guessing even a little bit for my opponent who's been in the office for a while, is the complexity of the issues and the uh, and the systems we're talking about. It's hard to give short answers to some of these questions. Um, you know, the uh, first off, I think to try to answer your question as directly as I can, I think the technologies exist today to, you know, uh, um, load balance the variable energy resources across the existing grid. Um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories earlier this year had approved by the Western Electrical Coordinating Council a new grid forming model that actually does that very thing. It's transformative. Um, you know, this is a big part of my campaign. You know, what happens with the dams, the lower Snake River dams, quite honestly, whether they stay or go has virtually no impact on our situation here or on the services we get. All that power is sold to surplus for one thing. And quite honestly, you know, I just don't know what to think about them. They've been admired in controversy forever. You know, people like to talk about dams, but there are more than 91,000 dams in the United States, 2,500 produce power. And most of those power was a sideline to the initial requirements of, of uh, irrigation and navigation. You know, the great thing about hydro for us and for the rest of the world where they, it exists is its flexibility and its adaptability and compatibility with variable energy resources. So I think that in combination with developing microgrids, you know, uh, uh, additional storage, uh, and looking at every other possible option for energy generation and distribution you know, we will have that diverse portfolio that we need and that rest of the world is rapidly scrambling to develop. Um, it's the challenge of the age, quite honestly. You know, electric, electrification of everything is, has happened. It's not happening. It's not maybe going to happen. The change has occurred. Change doesn't occur, you know, gradually. It occurs suddenly, you know, once momentum builds up. I mean, we live in a remarkable age, quite honestly, for an age that's rare for most people to experience. The complete transformation of how we live our lives. Stay up there, Ken. Uh, Go ahead, Scott. So, uh, well, you, you've been there for a while, and you're coming in with new ideas. So, uh, if if you're if you're elected or reelected, um, and during your next term, what is what is your number one objective that you'd like to achieve? 
Well, I have several. Um, I think the primary objective for me is to ensure that management and staff have all the resources, tools, and incentives to ensure that the organization is wholly customer focused. Uh, I mean, I think they, I think they, they want to be. I think they try to be. But I think the organization has become so internally focused that they literally forget who the audience is. In fact, I've, I've heard you know staff say that in meetings recently in trying to explain something. And, and, and I think I think my opponent actually asked the engineer to, to say it you know, in, in English so people would understand. And his response was, I forget who the audience is. And, and I, you know, I've just found, and this relates back to the question about open and transparent you know, government and active and aggressive engagement. I think that's the highest priority for me. I think that there are some, some gaps there and I think that that can be addressed. And I think it takes you know, the a, a, a kind of tested and trained experience that I have as a civic leader, you know, to help help them get there and do that. I think the second most important and or equally important is this issue of energy resilience and some finding some way to get to some measure of energy independence. You know, we are at the end of the line. Um, and we are the first to lose power, the, the last to get it back on in a what severe weather event, and heaven forbid in a catastrophic event. You know, there's no way to know how long we would be without power. So to have some measure of energy independence to at least recharge and repower emergency services, I think absolutely true. Okay, uh, going forward, PUD is faced with some decisions. Uh, one of those will be that uh, Bonneville contracts expire in 2028. The schedule now is, is that we'll first see the new contracts in 2023. They want us to execute those in 2025 and in effect in 2028. I'll emphasize we have not seen those contracts. We've tried to influence what's in those contracts and we have some idea of it. Uh, my opponent here says I'll sign any contract that's put in front of me. That's, that's certainly not the case. I have a long career of not doing that. So, um, that's 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 an issue. The other issue is legislation, the mandates on clean energy. Uh, we are going to have to evolve into uh, more clean energy. Hydro is going to be part of that. There's going to be other options available. We're participating in wind farms and solar and, and nuclear. And uh, so we're going to have to structure all of that so we can keep our rates low and affordable and reliable. Emphasis on reliability and affordability. And so that's that's going to be the, the drive for the next next term for me. Did he stay up there? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Sorry. We, we got to hit this dance now. <laughs> um, we've been talking a lot about the provision of appropriate types um, of power. How do you think PUD should address the demand side? What is the role of the PUD in not only education, but providing new banks for our infrastructure for uh, windows and aging homes, appliances, resources? Okay, yeah. A lot of this legislation pairs with it. We have to have a conservation program. And we have to lay that out over a five year period going forward. And that has to be audited by the Department of Commerce. And so we have programs for all of those things you mentioned We're insulation, double pane windows. And, and we've been doing this for years, even before it was mandated. And we've kind of done the low hanging fruit. You probably remember the, the fluorescent, compact fluorescent bulbs. I've got a closet for them. But anyway. So now, though, it's evolved into more expensive items like uh, ductless heat pumps and hot water heaters that are based on um, heat pump technology. So that, that's going to be more and more expensive. It, it's, um, we're doing that, collaborating with Bonneville on that. They have a program. But so far, we've got stellar reviews from the Department of Commerce on our, on our conservation programs. And you know, if you do more of it beyond what has been mandated, then that cost. They used to call it demand side management. So it means that if you put that cost into your rates, then yeah, yeah you're using less energy, but you're also uh, the people that are 
not taking advantage of it. They are they are having to pay for it. So uh, we're doing a lot on that, and we're going to continue to do that. And it keeps getting larger pieces of the puzzle. So conservation has been, is today, and always will be the best way for ratepayers to save on their energy costs. Um, you know, the measures that the uh, PUD currently offers are just passed through rebates from BPA. And they, uh, people apply for them, and then the PUD hands those customers over to private sector providers to implement those measures, which is great. Um, the problem is that uh, many of the measures, uh, including some of the specific ones you mentioned, weatherization, uh, insulation, can have severe unintended consequences if not properly applied. I think that the PUD needs to do more. I think they need to have an active program of education and support for those who want to employ or deploy or, uh, energy conservation measures. Um, there is a cost associated with that. Um, but I believe it would be offset by the savings in energy consumption. I also disagree with my opponent on targets. I mean, the, the PUD sets minimum targets and achieves those and often exceeds them a little bit. But over the last three years of monitoring these targeted goals, we have still increased our net energy consumption. I think we need to set higher targets as many places around the country are, including places like Colorado and California. And even Idaho are setting twice the state, twice the target levels. Instead of one percent or one and a quarter, they're targeting two percent or two and a half or percent uh, uh, conservation targets, and they're meeting and exceeding those, and actually saving net energy over the course of a given year. Um, I guess that's all. <laughs> This is over earlier. I'd like to actually circle back around on your answer to my question. Uh, so it's Ken, can you tell us more about when your your goal of energy independence? How do you see that being achieved? And then for you, Will, how do you feel about Ken's thoughts of moving forward? Uh, well, I think it can be achieved um, with the technology that exists today um, in uh, coordination and cooperation with uh, um, some existing uh, variable energy resources, rooftop solar. Um, I think that uh, to accomplish that would require some investment, probably in storage, uh, likely battery storage, and uh, as well as uh, um, investment in microgrids. Um, so that we can uh, have you know, areas that can be isolated and operated as an island during a power outage. I also happen to think that uh, a key factor in the long-term picture is a better contract negotiation with BPA. Um, I don't think I've actually accused Will of signing any contract that comes before him, but you know, the contracts, this 20-year contract that we're currently under is not the historic form of contract. I find nowhere in the legislation, it may be there, I may not have found it yet, that says to be a customer that gets the lowest possible federally mandated rate by a PUD, that you have to sign the same contract as everybody else. All the legislation says is you have to have a contract. And I think because of our unique conditions here in Clallam County, we're entitled to a more flexible contract than we've been given access to. You know, the contract they want us to sign doesn't even guarantee rates or the cost of transmission. All it does is bind us to a contract. The rates are set every two years and we have very little control over that you know, as time goes by. So I think that's actually a key uh, component in the long term. More flexibility in our contract, we need more access to large uh, volumes, uh, large capacity power to support the industry I was talking about that we've had a hard time supporting to, to date. And I think that's gonna be a key, that flexibility and access to other variable energy resources like uh, terrestrial wind from Central Washington. Okay. Energy independence is a, is a great concept. Uh, I would be concerned, if you look at a map, the World Bank Geologic Survey puts out maps of solar intensity, that's just the kilowatts per square meter of solar intensity. Uh, the best location in the U.S. is Mojave Desert. No, no surprise. The worst location is where we're sitting right now. 
without subsidies and all that, I, I admire people that will spend twenty to forty thousand dollars putting solar panels on their homes, but expecting that to pay out in a very reasonable period is uh, problematic. Uh, a lot of people can't afford that investment. So PUD over the years, even before the all this legislation, we looked at other types of renewables. We looked at wave energy off the new bay. We looked at the first wind farm that would be west of the Cascades down in uh, called Radar Ridge. And all those projects prompted a lot of opposition. Audubon Society built the wind farm. Uh, the offshore uh, wave energy was, was opposed. So anyway, we've looked at those options. Now, there are options that would make us energy independent out here. And I don't know what the public would accept this or not, but a small modular nuclear reactor. But you're talking about a tremendous investment, you're talking about billions of dollars. There's not even an operating uh, small modular or micro reactor in service now. It won't be in service until 2030. So energy independence is a great idea, but if you're going to put a lot of wind farms out here and cover the whole county with solar panels, it might be achievable, but it's going to cost. The, the uh, Bonneville power is, is less than half of what renewable market power costs. So. Stay up there. No, but uh, I can't. You have the problem anymore. Yeah. This is uh, another generalist question. Um, what we've heard about a lot in campaign season is um, the housing issue and um, how that impedes economic growth because where are people uh, going to live who work for the industry for the broadband? Um, but the, uh, the QD has a big role to play in economic development as well, I think. Because fine if they move here, but what if they can't hook up with uh, water and heat and electricity? So it's limited. So I would like both of you to talk about how you view the people going forward in these really rocky times to increase economic <coughs> development in a sustainable way in our county. Okay. PUD does have a direct role in housing. We have an indirect role because we have to make housing affordable, and we do that through um, conservation, through uh, under the new legislation, this CETA legislation. We, you have to uh, provide support for disadvantaged people, and this this bar was set at twice the federal <laughs> poverty level, and. We've looked at that preliminary. It looks like about 30% of the population would qualify for the systems. So that will that will provide the means to own a home, rent an apartment, whatever. And also uh, the service charge that goes with connecting would be covered. Under. So PUDs can do this by you know those programs, number one, making housing more affordable. And we can also uh, encourage people through conservation and so on. So that's what we're doing. Um, interesting thing for me about this question is the arc of my professional career has made me a, an expert in housing. Um, I have more than 10,000 housing units to my architectural uh, credit including everything from supportive housing, assisted living housing, low income housing to mid and high end housing. And you know, it's interesting and it's uh, something I spent a lot of time thinking about because the housing crisis we're talking about here is not just here, it's not just Seattle, it's global. I mean, it's, it's actually pandemic like levels around the planet. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, uh, with the pandemic that we've just sur you know, survived barely, I guess. Um, and uh, the patterns of those who have great means buying up real estate in places all over the planet. And it's just really a serious issue, quite honestly. And the solutions are difficult. And more often than not, uh, um, the solutions that are sought um, are ineffective. Um, 
so it's a very challenging issue and uh and i take it very seriously and uh and uh um you know and uh, i think i have some ideas of how to fix it but that's not my role or nor would it be within the pud so i agree with my uh, opponent here that there is no direct role for the pud but that said i do do believe that we should be sitting at the table with the groups that are trying to work to solve the problem here locally i think there are ways we could uh, the pud can help um i think that uh, um you know low interest loans no cost loans uh, support for, for the cost of utilities and services could all be explored. And again, those things don't come for free, but I think it's also absolutely essential, especially in the role uh, that the PUD plays as uh, a key factor in our economic development. It's absolutely important. So I do think there's a way to participate, um, and I think that it would be a very useful participation. Stay up there. We've reached the end of our time, our scheduled time. So now we'll have two minute closing statements. So so, uh, Ken, you're first. I have to have my nose. Still, still not quite awake. <laughs> yes. No problem. We did two uh, forums yesterday, uh, noontime with Todd on the radio, which was really fun. Thank you, Todd. Um, and then we had the Builders Association in the evening. I don't know about you, but I couldn't get to sleep till after 10 and then woke up way too early this morning. Anyway, um, in closing, I, you know, I'm a longtime resident and ratepayer of Fallon County. You know, I'm passionate about our community uh, across the county. Um, you know, I feel like even though we're being elected to District One, which is East uh, Clallam County, I think we all, I think all of the commissioners represent the entire county. Um, I spent my professional and civic careers working hard to make a difference. Uh, to ensure our mutual health and well-being, driven by a vigorous support of economic development. Economic prosperity across the county is essential to our individual and community health and well-being. So I'm running for PUD commissioner to bring control, to bring control to rate inflation, to rebalance the base cost versus the use cost, which is key to incentivizing conservation and deployment of solar, rooftop solar, um, to complete broadband connectivity across the county, an essential service, and I believe a universal right of access like water, sewer, and electricity secure our energy future and water utility future as we've been discussing and then again to support and expand our local economy we must be looking forward looking vigilant for any opportunity to improve our energy and water resilience we must strive for some measure of energy independence to ensure we can repower essential services after severe weather or catastrophic events uh, the pud G general manager recently stated that our system has more exposure to system outages than almost any other utility as do the BPA transmission lines serving the area. He also stated that we would be the, one of the first customers, BPA customers in the region to be load shedded. That means diverting the power to somewhere else in the event of shortages. It's time for our PUD leadership to do more, to be fully focused on customer needs and addressing customer concerns, all customers. I'm running to make a difference. And I possess the skills and the experience to do so. Chris, I need my notes as well. <laughs> well, as you probably gathered by now, I'm not a politician. I've uh, actually continued to serve on the PUD Commission for 21 years. I kind of feel like it's a public service. I, I love my adopted community, enjoy living here, great people, great location. So I feel like I owe, using my experience and background, benefit the, the area. Uh, I'm not seeking re-election for personal gain. The UD Commission doesn't pay a lot. The uh, And I funded my campaign almost entirely uh, and refused donations from special interest groups or like <coughs> quick pro quo sources and so on. Uh, I'm also proud of the organization, the PUD. You know, I used to give performance evaluation to employees, and my philosophy, and HR agreed with this, that you, it wasn't to be a feel-good session. Everybody needs areas of improvement, so you identify those areas of improvement. So the PUD is not perfect, <laughs> but it's pretty damn good. So anyway, I would, and you know, it's been demonstrated by, uh, receiving national awards. PUD is receiving uh, 
reports of reliability for being a smart provider, even our financial reporting. And these are not participation trophies. These are national uh, competitions between 2,000 other public utilities. So that's pretty, pretty good evidence that we're doing a pretty good job. So anyway, that's what I continue to be doing and going forward. So uh, if you want more information, look on my website, uh, Will Purser for FORPUD.com, and I would appreciate your vote. Okay, let's give a big hand. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. Uh, okay, thank you. Did you do us the honors? Thanks for running the.